I'll kick us off. I'm Amanda Doyle. I'm Assistant Director of the Enterprise Data Management Team here at City Planning. I'm joined by uh, Sasha Weinstein, who will be presenting with me today. Uh, Max is also online, and then Ta is unfortunately out sick today. So uh, I'm just going to note, I'm going to turn my camera off just to save my Wi-Fi. Uh, so today's presentation is governing data engineering's 2021 year in review. Uh, we're riffing on the format that we did last year, which was our 2020 year in review, uh, just highlighting new tools and products, this time built mostly at home during a pandemic, because there were certainly times uh, throughout 2021 where uh, we were in the office um, as we are today. So for those of you who don't know, uh, who's data engineering? So we're a relatively new team at City Planning. We just turned four. Um, I don't know when I stop counting how old we are. And what we do is we rethink, reimagine, and rebuild some of DCP's core data products. And then lastly, but very importantly, we make sure that what we do is open, transparent, and reproducible. So everything you see here today um, you can dive into more because all of our code is open on GitHub. When starting the data engineering team four years ago, it was not only important just to make data public, but also how that data is created uh, public. So that if a data user really wanted to dive into how a specific value in a field was created, he or she could do so. So who are we? Um, we're a mighty team of four. So there's myself. Um, we then have uh, kind of going across. We have Sasha, Max, and Ta. We are, you know, first and foremost data engineers. We have backgrounds in geography, math, and stats. Uh, I personally love cities, so I live in Manhattan, um, and we are all data enthusiasts by what we do. So general overview of what we do, of like our core work is often just turning, um, you know, tabular data or worst case scenario, uh, PDF formats of data and making it spatial and turning it into a format so that it could be used by our uh, applications, many of which are created by our digital services team, you know, formerly known as labs. And how do we do it? So this is kind of a big splash page of the technologies that we use. Postgres and PostGIS are bread and butter. Uh, that's you know, where we do lots of data processing and host our data. All of our code is up on GitHub. We store a lot of our source data and final products in DigitalOcean uh, and make data available internally on Cardo to be used by our applications. So like 2020, uh, 2021 was also a year uh, with lots of peaks and valleys. Still, the team accomplished a lot. And then one thing to note that I forgot to mention in the beginning. So many of the team members that you see are like very new. They joined in late 2021. So they inherited many of these products um, and you know, will be working on the things that we'll be working out in 2022. So overall, what did we do? These are the four things that we're going to cover today um, in slight depth. So we implemented data library. We automated our publication workflows. We updated population fact finders with 2020 data. And we built and released uh, new data products. I'm going to talk about uh, two of those. And we did a lot more, but there's only so much you can cover in an hour. So with the first thing about data library, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that over to Sasha, uh, who can talk about data library. Awesome, thanks, Amanda. Hey, everybody, I'm um, Sasha, one of the engineers here on data engineering. Um, and I'm gonna be talking um, about one of our most important data products, which is data library. This is a um, technology that we use written by our engineers to uh, store and version um, source data uh, write it up to the cloud so that it can be um, downloaded um, for our other data products, right? Big part of what we do is we incorporate source data from a pretty disparate, um, you know, group of, of places. We, we need to bring all these different data sets and combine them all. And so organizing our source data um, is uh, essential to making sure that we stay 
um, organized. Um, so another thing that it that it does is that it automates our routine updates, right? Like you can see up here on the screen, there's a, a group of data sets listed under the um, matrix colon data set colon, which are like, they're all kind of related. They're like parks or other spatial data, right? This is can all be kind of um, up like a process and upload in the same group of processes. And so if you're sitting down, you want to develop on a project that involves one of these data sets, this can just be like one, one job that's automatically run in the background so that you can be like, reasonably confident that you're getting the most up-to-date um, data for this like group of data sets. So you can like just focus on the important work, which is developing and not have to worry about tracking each one down and making sure that it's, it's up-to-date. And then lastly, uh, it, um, or another, another really important thing that it does is it imposes structure on our spatial data, right? Um, spatial data is uh, a more complicated kind of, um, of data, right? Because the geometry needs to be um, read and stored in the correct way so that the technologies that we use can correctly map uh, like polygons and points, which is, you know, vital to, to what we do, whether, um, you know, looking at the map that Amanda showed of like parks and libraries or visualizing um, districts or, or counting up different, um, you know, individual things that exist within a district or a borough, right? All of that requires having good geospatial information. And so, um, making sure that before, you know, when you sit down to develop, like that has already been handled, that we know that the geometry will be in the right place and we know that it'll have the right um, kind of precision um, is just like a big, big time saver and, and allows us to um, just develop like with more, um, with more uh, like, in, like um, really knowing that our data is going to be correct in the way that it needs to be. Awesome, and now that's kind of like what it does. And now I wanted to, to spend a little bit more time talking about um, why it's so important, right? We don't, you know, we could do a lot of the work we do without data library, it would just be much harder and we would get caught up dealing with source data, which is like, um, takes away from the time that we should be spending developing, right? And so one big thing is consistency, uh, writing column names that, you know, send spaces to lowercase, or send spaces to underscores, make sure that everything is lowercase, it seems simple, but it just saves a ton of time when you pull down a source data, you kind of have, a, have an easier time finding the exact column that you're looking for. Same thing with the folder structure. You know, it seems simple, but having a consistent way to drill down from, you can look at a data set, you can see which versions, and then from there you look at the files and um, finally like matching data across the formats, right? If you want to get a CSV of, um, I don't know, Pluto data, but then you also want to get it um, in its SQL form, you want to make sure that there's the same information right across those two files. That's really important. And so data library will make sure that if it's if that whenever that version is um, sent up to the cloud, that it's kind of written in the same process, ensures that it's coming from the same source data, which um, you know, every single thing here seems simple, but if every time you sit down to develop, you have to kind of come go through one problem with any of these, you know, just like it takes a bunch of time that we'd rather be spending um, building new data products or improving existing ones. Um, another really important thing about data library, right, is that um, we can be sure that only data engineers on our team are writing to cloud storage. And we can be sure that um, it's, you know, people have some kind of baseline level of expertise um, and context knowledge to be sending things up to the cloud. Um, it's not a terribly difficult product to use, but it does require um, Docker and you know, uses GitHub actions and it's complicated enough that we have like some, <laughs> we limit access to the degree that um, we can we can know who's sending stuff up there. Um, cool, and then the, the last bullet point here, right, is that like, if I, you know, I'm a fairly new engineer, I started here um, in the fall, right? And I wanna see the process used to upload some past source data, right? Um, I can kind of go in and see this like formalized set of instructions of how this source data is located and loaded and all this stuff, right? And so whether that's like, um, I just wanna understand where it's coming from and how it got there, or I need to um, run the process again for a, a new version of the source data, or whether I wanna kind of take that process and adjust it, having as much of a, a formalized set of instructions complete with documentations and commit messages. You know, so much of what we do here is trying to make sure that we provide good documentation, not just, you know, what we did, but, but how we did it. Um, data library kind of ensures that we have that for our for our source data processes. Awesome, yeah. And then there's a, a link in 
the spreadsheet that we'll share where you can learn more about data library. And that is it for me. Thanks, Amanda. Awesome. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, so that's the first thing that we want to highlight. So the second thing that we wanted to highlight is our publication workflow. So why did we automate our publication workflow? Basically to minimize the effort to move data from enterprise data management into digital services applications. Um, so at data engineering, we, as Sasha said, we take source data, we stage it, we then create a data products from that source data, and then we need to feed it into applications so that users like you can access it. And where we can save time, um, we then like to build things to automate and save time. So how did we do this? GitHub Actions. Um, GitHub Actions was something that we talked about in our uh, Open Data Week presentation last year. It has been phenomenal. We've really um, applied it to everything that we can. And so uh, like data libraries, we implemented a folder structure for this publication workflow. So we have our, you know, our publication folder, we have the data sets under that, you can go into any single data set, and then you would see specific versions of that data set. But then in these, you would see a folder for staging and production, and there would be a version of a data set in each of those folders in staging and production. So what is this workflow? So using a cron job, um, a daily diff check is run between the data sets in a given staging folder and a given production folder. If there's a difference detected, an issue is opened, and you can see it has the name of that data set. Uh, we use labels to say, you know, is this data set part of a specific application or you know, not? Someone from the digital services would then go in and sit and check the data in the staging environment because uh, you know, we pushed a new version of data up into the staging environment. So in the staging application, the data should be updated. If, you know, it breaks the application and, you know, something doesn't look right, they report back to us being like, hey, something broke. We say, okay, we fix it. But if everything looks good, then he or she would update the label to move the data into production. And it is simple as updating a label in GitHub. So you add the published label to the issue in GitHub, that would trigger a GitHub action. The data set would be copied over from the staging folder into the production folder. It would then uh, flow downstream into the production application. Again, for best practice to make sure that nothing broke, someone should check it. And if everything looks good, voila, we are done. And so um, that, you know, process of six steps, uh, you know, has really expedited uh, moving data uh, from, you know, our environment into applications um, and making sure that it's, you know, reviewed uh, in the process. So again, like anything, yeah, we'll share out this deck um, and that's a link to the repo that's specific to this workflow. The third thing that we would like to talk about, uh, which took up about most of our summer, is updating Population Fact Finder with 2020 data. Now, uh, as you probably know, uh, the 2020 census was held during a pandemic and the data was released in 2021. Uh, so, you know, with that triggered uh, a bunch of work to get the data uh, into Population Fact Finder, which is one of City Planning's premier applications. So what did that involve? Um, so much of the work was translating data that was originally released in 2010 geographies into 2020 geographies to facilitate time series analysis. Because many of the use cases are well, how did population change over time? Um, and you want to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges in this case. And so it involves allocating count values in 2010 census tracts to 2020 census tracts. And tracts could split and tracts can merge. 
So what does this look like? So on the left in red, you have 2010 census tracts. And then in the right in blue, you have 2020 census tracts. And the areas in pink are areas where census tracts split due to population growth. Uh, because the goal of the census is to have about equal number of people in each tract. And so in places where uh, population grew, tracts need to be split up. And you know, some of these areas are pretty obvious, like Hudson Yards, you know, along the Hudson River on the west side, Long Island City, and parts of Greenpoint um, have seen lots of population growth in the past decade. So, how do we uh, allocate data in the cases of track splits? So, I'm going to briefly walk you through a very simple example. Uh, so, for example, say here we have a 2010 tract. That tract is made up of eight blocks. Um, and between 2010 data and 2020 data, we treat blocks as one-to-one -one, uh, in this. So we're not trying to um, map blocks to blocks here. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. So say in 2020, uh, you know, this area was split in half. You have tracked 1.1 here with a population of 3,000 people and uh, tracked 1.2 on the right with a population of 1,000 people. So the portion of the 2010 value would be allocated 75%, 25% from that you know, single 2010 geography into these two new 2020 geographies. This is a um, snapshot of the entire workflow uh, because it is a bit more complicated than just a simple proportionment. So a few other things that we needed to do to kind of get this right. Uh, we needed to calculate 2020 track level estimates and margin, margins of errors in the cases of splits and mergers. Um, and Population Fact Finder is a really powerful tool because you can uh, create custom geographies, um, but there are edge cases. And so working with our population team to make sure that we were doing it right was definitely time intensive. And then we also had to work to convert from 2010 tracks to other 2020 geographies, such as NTAs um, and CDTAs, uh, which is a new geography that was introduced in 2020. And again, like anything, we'll share the deck um, and that will link to the documentation on Population Fact Finder and the work that we did there. And new data products. So I'm going to highlight two. The first one is the city owned and leased properties data set. And many of you are probably saying, hey, Amanda, that's not new. That's been out for a really long time. Uh, in the spirit of uh, data engineering's work, lots of our work is reverse engineering data sets. Um, so but before I dive into that, just briefly, for those of you who don't know, city owned and leased properties is put out by the Department of City Planning the source data comes from DCAS, uh, which is the um, Department of Citywide Administrative Services. And that's the agency that's more or less the city's landlord. And they maintain a record, um, whether some of you may know it as the Gazetteer or some of you may know of it as IPIS, but more or less they maintain records of every single property that the city owns or leases. Um, they do conduct a survey every two years with all of um, the city agencies to update their information. So they'll send out an Excel spreadsheet to say, hey, this is the information we have on your properties. Could you go ahead and verify that? And that's what they'll use to update their system. Um, so like many data sets that the Department of uh, City Planning publishes, it came into our court because at the time, uh, we were the agency with the most robust GIS skills. And so when it came to needing to create a map um, for these data, they said, hey, city planning, you're the agency with the skills to do this, so please do it. And there was legislation written in the city charter for that. So, uh, so as you can see, the uh, city owns um, or leases lots of properties. Um, and so 
we reverse engineered an existing data set and we've done this for lots of things. So like Pluto is an example of like a data set that we ended up reverse engineering. Um, so now, you know, we own the code, we can improve the data set. Uh, and then we also are planning to publish the data set two times per year instead of every two years. Um, and this was what we heard from users. You know, users are really, you know, they like this data set. They want to know what properties the city owns and leases and how that changes over time more frequently than every two years. So we worked with DCAS and we said, well, you know, even though they're only conducting the survey every two years, we asked them if it would make sense to put the data out more frequently. And they were enthralled with the idea um, because they are updating their data, you know, as information comes to them. And again, like anything we do, the code is open and available. And additionally, you know, it's still on Bytes. So the version that we put out is on Bytes available for download. And then, you know, Bytes have a, has a wonderful archive feature. Uh, so you can find previous versions of Cult there too. So the next data product I want to talk about is the Capital Projects Database. And also for some of you who work in city government, you may say, Amanda, that's not a new data product. You and Chris Wong built that in like 2016. And I'll say, yes, but we just released it to the public in 2021 um, because of politics. So, so the Capital Projects Database, um, we, so, a colleague of mine, Luba, and I did a whole presentation on it uh, during Open Data Week for School of Data. If you are interested in this data set, I definitely encourage you to uh, look for that presentation um, or reach out if you have specific questions because this is just going to be a, a quick overview of what it is and not necessarily a deep dive. So the Capital Projects Database maps, pub, maps, sorry, maps projects published in the Capital Commitment Plan. The Capital Commitment Plan is a document that's put out by the Office of Management and Budget three times a year. Um, and it is you know, a forward looking document for capital projects. And a capital project is anything that has a lifespan of five years or more and costs $35,000 or more. So that's just important to note what the universe is here um, in that it, doesn't include all capital projects that have happened in history because it's just, again, a snapshot of what's forward looking. And it doesn't include funding for like programs, um, you know, or like programmatic funding. Again, the code is available. But then, kind of, you know, what is this thing? So the capital uh, commitment plan looks like this. <laughs> Uh, it's put out in four volumes by the Office of Management and Budget. And the first thing that we need to kind of, you know, understand is, well, what, what is this telling us? And we were able to kind of discern three things. What's highlighted in orange is what we define as a project. So in orange, you know, there's a project happening at uh, 115 Christie Street reconstruction. What's highlighted in green, we do, would describe as a future commitment. So this is an individual line item of future monies committed for this project. And so, um, you know, there's an uh, amount of money that's allocated for June uh, 2023 and June 2024 uh, for the design phase of this project. And then in blue highlights the budget line for this project. And so that's the specific budget from which these monies are coming from. So when Chris Long and I were first digging into this, um, we scraped the PDF, uh, which worked, uh, but it wasn't perfect because if a project spanned more than one page, we would miss information from at the second page. Um, but it was a good start. And then we went to the Office of Management and Budget and they said, we'll just give you the information in an Excel spreadsheet. And we said, thank you. Um, so we get the data directly from them. 
But then we make the data available in a view like this. So if you are a user of the capital commitment plan, uh, you no longer need to use a, you know, you don't longer need to use the PDF to find information on individual projects. Uh, you can use the Capital Planning Explorer, which is an application that was released to the public again in December of 2021 and host this data set. And so this is the table view of that. So you can see that it has 12,211 projects that you can search here and kind of dig into. But then the really, really valuable view is we worked really hard to map the data that we could. So, you know, less than half of all projects are maps. You'll see that it's showing, you know, 5,223 projects. And that's because not all projects that are in the capital commitment plan are place specific. So we define them as three different categories. Some things could be a lump sum. So a large sum of money in which individual projects are then drawn down from. Other things could be IT vehicles or equipment, which, you know, yes, you might have servers stored in the building, but it doesn't necessarily impact a neighborhood. And then there's your fixed assets. And that's what we focus on. I mean, those are your road sewers, parks, um, things that whether you directly see or not impact a neighborhood. And that's what we're focused on mapping here. We map data um, using several ways. So we get spatial data from our agency partners. So the Department of Design and Construction, Department of Transportation, and Economic Development Corporation all maintain spatial data on their capital projects. And so we get data from them. It's the most accurate source. We then also use fuzzy string matching where we can to map data on parks and public facilities. Uh, and then there's some manual mapping involved. Um, the one thing that we you know, didn't implement, which I'm could potentially be an enhancement for this data set is to implement a lot of the geocoding work that we uh, learned and have implemented for other projects over the years into this to you know, run data through geosupport to see if it improve our, our hit rate. And then, like I said, so uh, that uh, the Capital Projects database is available on the Capital Planning Explorer. This has been available to city agencies since 2017. But again, in December of 2021, we made it to the, we released it to the public. Um, it hosts three of our core data sets. So capital projects and plans, the facilities and program sites database, and the housing database, which was the data product that we released to the public in 2020. So what else have we done? So over the summer, while we were working on Population Fact Finder, we were hosting two fellows and we were looking at the viability of Google Cloud Platform, GCP for short, uh, to host a data ecosystem. And with the data ecosystem, so it was three things. So one, catalog data, two, host data in a database, and three, be a visualization tool. And Google Cloud Platform has all those capabilities. So we tasked them with loading every single version of Pluto into BigQuery, and they did it. And it was awesome. Um, because this is such a massive data set that often people have even a hard time working with a single version. Um, but now, you know, at least internally, people have the ability to work with dozens of versions. And this has enabled change over time analysis. And so this is something that we started. We look forward to exploring more of it in uh, 2022 as uh, planners kind of start exploring with it and thinking about how they could use it for their use cases. We also enhanced our QAQC dashboards. So um, we have a Streamlit app, which is you know, available to the public that shows you know, how our data sets change over time and it is a way for us to review our data sets. Um, you know, if a, if a variable has a drastic change in a version, that often means that something may have gone wrong. Uh, so we spent some time enhancing those so that we could offload some of the QAQC tasks to users, or sorry, to, um, 
team members who aren't necessarily data engineers so that we can focus on building and not necessarily maintenance. We improved the geocoding for the facilities database. If you're a user of that, you may have noticed an improvement in the hit rate of uh, you know, what we were able to geocode. We collaborated with our geographic research unit and we uh, built a couple of QAQC data sets for them to help automate the kind of regular reviews that they do of their data. Um, and then we did lots of maintenance. We're a team that likes maintenance. And so, you know, keeping our stack up to date is important to us. So that's what we did for 2021. Um, so what do we have for 2022? Currently working on the Equable Data Development Tool is our top priority and um, kind of biggest time commitment at the moment. So this is a project that stemmed from Local Law 78 the, with the goal of providing access to data to inform public discussions about racial equity and planning for a fairer city. Really important initiative. Um, but this is an example of legislation that was written by non-data people. And so uh, the legislation specifies about 60, you know, what's called indicators. So uh, for example, you know, uh, median age in an area broken out by race and ethnicity. That has translated to several thousand data points. So you can imagine kind of the, the back end messiness of, uh, you know, collecting source data, curating it, normalizing all of it so that it's consistent across all tables, and then trying to make it digestible to an end user. Because if you just throw them several thousand data points, um, they're not going to be able to, you know, ingest that information and make it meaningful. So this is definitely will be a priority project for us between now and April 1, um, then spending more time of it until June, and then we'll continue to do maintenance on it uh, for in perpetuity. We would also like to expand our QAQC workflows again, even though we always, you know, we're always working on QAQC, but we are constantly striving to make our data products better. And so, you know, getting input from users, but then also seeing, you know, what inconsistencies exist across our data sets. Um, so we want to add uh, QAQC dashboards for new data and then continue to improve existing reports. We want to collaborate with GRU again. So we want to work with them to optimize some of their ETL workflows. Um, they have legacy systems. Um, some ETL workflows take over a day to run, um, which was great a decade ago, but, you know, we can make them better. And then GRU does their quarterly QA process. So if you are a GeoSupport user, you would be familiar that new software and data are released uh, every quarter. And with that release, there are standard QA QC procedures. And so we're looking forward to collaborating with them again to you know, help automate some of that review uh, to you know, standardize it, make it a little, mess, little less manual. And then more maintenance. Um, so we you know, adopted GitHub Actions heavily in 2021. We look forward to standards standardizing how we've um, applied GitHub Actions and its triggers across of our data products. Some refactoring needs to be done of our code bases. We have new team members on. Um, they see ways to make improvements. And then to backfill documentation, which is key to anything that we do. And more. And you'll find out about what those more are in our 2022 year for review. So that's it. Um, I'm glad that I have time for questions and discussion. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. That was really all really fascinating. I'm Sarah Rankin. I work at the New York Public Library. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the equitable development tool and what that will allow users to do and what the approach is to, to building it. Sure. So the equitable development tool um, again, arose from legislation. And so now um, 
don't quote me on all the details because uh, my head is a little in the weeds on the data part. But um, when on some applications, uh, depending on if the application kind of triggers this need, um, an applicant will need to provide uh, various data points on the area in which they're building. Um, and those data points are, you know, cover demographic um, and socioeconomic in indicators, as well as uh, data points that get at measuring the quality of life in an area. Um, it breaks information down by race and ethnicity where possible. And so the goals to make this information easily accessible so that planning is done in a fairer lens. And I can definitely point you to the legislation, uh, which has in-depth information about like, yeah, what data I've been needs to be about provided. This, yeah, the legislation and the, you know, yeah, I was interested to hear what the role, so this is really about making the data available to folks who need to grab that for their applications and work. Okay. Exactly. So we're like data engineering, I would describe us as the data brokers. And so um, we're getting the data from the, I don't know, almost hundred data sources and then normalizing it and then pushing it over to our digital services team who will then feed that data into an application. Mm -hmm. On the data library, is that an in-house tool or how, like, I've been thinking a lot about how we document data sets and so forth. And I'm wondering, like, how that came to be, how you, like, build, yeah. It's in-house. It yeah. It, um, it was thought up in-house. And so, you know, like Saucer said, um, even though the repo is open, uh, only if you're a data engineering team member can you actually contribute to our data library. But all the code's open so that if you do have this need to uh, curate your source data. Um, it's there for you to fork and riff on um, and contribute to. So yeah, it was built entirely in-house. Yeah, I'm just wondering about pull requests. Uh, I, I, when I, I saw you have issues like good first issue, are these things for the public or for your team for the most part? No, um, we do accept public pull requests. Um, it's something that we have done in the past. So uh, if there, if you do want to contribute to our code base, um, you could submit a pull request. We would review it um, and then decide, is this an improvement that we would want to incorporate? And we would, pull, we would merge it in. OK, great. Is there, is there a repo that you're specifically looking at? I'm curious. Oh no, not not at the moment. I was just browsing and okay. noticed that you did have issues open and was looking through them. That, that whenever you're looking at a data set or a, or a repo, it's always good to see what the issues are to to, to go below. Yeah, the and and on the flip side of that, you know, if you're working with any of our repos um, and you do, you know, see a problem, whether it's with the data set or, or really anything, feel free to open an issue as well, and anyone from the public can do that. What type of uh, interagency collaboration have you been able to forge around geolocation data in the city? Has the city hired a geospatial data officer? I know that they were posting for one. I guess in, in kind of like what sense? So like there's city planning who, from my perspective, publishes like the authoritative source on political boundaries throughout New York City. But is there... Like there's no one stop shop besides open data for geospatial data across agencies. I mean, it's been in conversation even before I joined city government. I think some of the obstacles are that every agency has their own like business use cases and their own, you know, infrastructure for how they operate. And so agreeing on something that's beyond open data has been a challenge. Okay. Okay, cool.